Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and arguing, so that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, in which you shine like stars in the world. It is by your holding fast to the word of life that I can boast of on the day of Christ that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, but even if I am being poured out as a libation over the sacrifice and the offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. And in the same way, you also must be glad and rejoice with me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we ask that you would speak to us now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I remember whenever I was a young man, I I know that I'm still a relatively young man, but when I was a younger man than I am right now, uh, I was very anxious about how to grow in the faith. I, for a period of years, was very, I mean, and this is still a desire that I have now, but even more so when I was in college and in high school, I had a fixation with reading the Bible and knowing what, what is in here, how can I know the word of the Lord, how can it help me become a more mature Christian in the faith, and not only what do I need to know with my mind, but how will that be translated through into my actions? How will I know what being a mature Christian is like? You know, thus far in my life, whenever I wanted to get stronger, or if I wanted to learn something, the answer was to go to the gym and work out, or uh, sit down and read, and read again, and read some more, and maybe you'll grow, watch others who know what they're doing. But how do we become mature in the faith? That's a good question. And it's not always easy, because as we read in the Bible, one of the things that it tells us is that we grow by God's grace. And so... Uh, We know that we're justified by faith alone, not by the works that we do. But still, there is some correspondence to our actions, to what we do. Well, I think that this passage today that McKenna uh, read for us a moment ago uh, speaks to this issue. And so here's what I hope that we'll see today as we look to Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. That our our, our unity as a congregation is dependent upon us acting our salvation through the Holy Spirit's empowering as we joyfully offer our lives in the service of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our united witness as a congregation is dependent upon us acting our salvation through the Holy Spirit's empowering in order that we might joyfully offer, as we joyfully offer up our lives in the service of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I think as we go through our passage today, we kind of see this take place in three distinct phases. And the first phase that we see is a truth, that is that our spiritual growth is a divine human process. Our spiritual growth is a divine human process. As the Apostle Paul speaks, he grounds what he wants the Philippians to accomplish in the work of Jesus. And he actually refers back to what uh, what we saw last week in his letter, namely, that we witness, we remember seeing how he spoke about the divine, the grand humiliation of Jesus Christ. Namely, that Jesus, the divine Son of God, humbled himself by becoming a human and dying, and whom God then exalted to his right hand. And not only is this the theological truth upon which our faith is founded, but Paul then says, but you also act this way towards one another. It's not just a truth that remains abstract out in the ether somewhere, but this should be embodied in your lives. As Jesus gave up his own wants, desires, and preferences for the needs of others. And indeed, he encourages us to count the needs of others as more significant than our own. And it's on the basis of that truth that Paul says in verse 12, Therefore, 
my beloved, as you've always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, or not only as in my yeah, presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Much like a parent would say to their child that you can't just obey when I'm around, you need to be obedient at all times. And he uses this phrase, which I think is significant. He says they are to work out their own salvation, to work out your own salvation. Now, again, we have to figure out what this means, because he he can't simply mean that we are to, through works, earn salvation. That would counteract his message, and not only his message in his letters, but the message of the entire Bible. Remember, he says that we are justified, that we are declared in the right before God, on the basis of our faith alone, not on the basis of the good works that we do. Indeed, later on in chapter 3, we'll see this in a couple of weeks, he even notices that his own good works, he says, they don't count as anything for me before Jesus, but rather, I look for the righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ that I receive by faith. But there still is a doing to our salvation. There is a working out, as the ESV says, of our salvation. And it's something that they're not left to do in their own strength. Verse 13, he says, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. But look at verse 13. This is the key. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So what Paul's saying is that as our salvation works itself out, as we are doing the effort, it's actually also God who is working in us. We shouldn't have to pause and be hung up over the question of, am am I doing the right thing, or is this God doing the right thing within me? Uh, But rather, it's a divine human act. Now, the priority does remain with the Lord, but our efforts are God's efforts as he empowers us by the Holy Spirit. And we read this elsewhere in the New Testament, a very famous passage. I think it'll sound familiar, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. It's a very famous passage. For it is by grace that you are saved through faith, And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we, but listen listen to verse 10 though, so not saved by your good works, verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we're saved by faith alone, but we are saved for good works, to do good things, And if we've read the Bible, that shouldn't surprise us too much. Because think about the example of Abraham, who we're told believed and it was counted to him as righteousness. But what did Abraham's belief look like? It meant him leaving the land that he grew up in, leaving the family that he was familiar with, and answering the call of God to go to and to take his family to a new land. Or consider Peter. He's in the boat with Jesus. The storms are raging, or he's in the boat without Jesus. They went ahead without him. The storms are raging and he's not sure what to do. And then who do they see coming to them from across the river, walking on water, but Jesus himself. And what does Peter do? He gets out of the boat and he walks on water until he looks at himself and he falls in. See, Peter believed, he had faith that that's what Jesus was doing. He had faith that through Jesus, he too could walk on water to meet him. And that faith manifested itself in him hoisting his leg out over the side of the boat and getting in the water. If he hadn't believed, he wouldn't have gotten in the water. This is how James frames it in James chapter 2. We have to remember this, that faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And so sometimes we might be anxious. Are we, am I doing good works from faith or from my own strength? One time I was a uh, leading a small group at the church that I lived, went to in Jackson, Tennessee. And there was a, a, a young college freshman there, and uh, I said, you know, what, how, how's your week been? And he's like, well, you know, on Saturday we, we started, we, we were going around and we were evangelizing. We were actually knocking on people's doors and sharing the gospel. But then I stopped and I said, oh, were, you, were you getting a lot of opposition? Were people shutting the doors in your face? He's like, no, I just wasn't doing it in the right heart. And I was like, wait. You were doing something that Jesus commanded you to do, but you stopped because you felt like you weren't doing it from the right motivation. And I understand how important that is, because the Bible does speak about our heart and the need to obey from the right position. However, that doesn't give us a reason to bow out. 
The answer isn't, am I doing this by faith or by God's strength, but rather, where is the source of my power coming from? Right? Am I trying to give myself a cheap grace that Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, where basically I, I forgive myself for my failings, and I, you know, I basically point to myself as the model for other people, or am I living by God's own grace that he's given to me in Jesus Christ? And this is where our good works come from. Right? Knowing this truth, it waylays our anxieties. We're not trying to earn our salvation when we do good works. We're not trying to earn God's favor. But we're becoming mature in Christ. And this is something that uh, Jesus calls us to. Right? The Christian who fails to mature isn't very much different from someone who is an emerging adult who is having a season of prolonged adolescence. And, and we know that that can last into one's 30s, 40s. 50s, 60s. I'm sure you know people in their 70s who still live as if they were 20 years old without a care in the world. It's not a bad thought to have for a 20 year old, but it's kind of embarrassing if that's the thought of a 70 year old. Indeed, our, our, although our, our physical age should correspond to our spiritual maturity, it doesn't always, but we're called to grow up. Right, right now, we're trying to expand Peter's palate. I was talking with someone before church about Peter's appetite. Uh, we don't give Peter steak yet. Uh, and he doesn't really eat any vegetables. We try, but he's not, he's not really keen to them. And it's not only that he's uninterested, that is true, but he's also a toddler. Right? I, I think I've learned that whenever Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine, he, it mainly was referring to don't give children nice food. At least that's what I've learned growing up. You know, to Peter, gummy snacks are about as important as bread. <laughs> and, you know, uh, we pray as he grows up, you know, we're, we're going to be diligent to keep feeding him other food. But if I meet an adult who mainly subsists off of gummy snacks, unless there's some, like, very particular medical concern, I'm kind of concerned for that adult. Here's how the author of Hebrews describes this in Hebrews 5. Verse 11 through 14, he says, About this we have much to say, and it's hard to explain, since you've become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child, but solid food is for the mature. For those who have, listen to this, for those who have their power of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Remember what Paul prayed at the beginning of Philippians in chapter 1? My prayer is that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment and so that you may approve of what is excellent and so be pure and blameless at the day of Christ Jesus. He wants their discernment to grow so that they can be mature disciples living out the faith. And if we are in Christ, we grow in maturity. Uh, as we think about how this happens in our lives, the, how does the power come from God? Uh, one pastor said one time that we are to act the miracle. Act the miracle. A miracle is whenever God does a special work in his creation that is unnormal from the way things normally go. Now, he's always control over everything, but a miracle is when he does something special. And what Paul's saying, God is doing something special in your life whenever you obey, whenever you work out your faith. But we're called to act it out. So our spiritual growth, our sanctification, our growth in holiness, remember, it's a two-sided process. It's not that we are equal partners with God. There is a priority with God's work first. But it is through his work inside of us that we become mature disciples. So that's phase one. That's phase one. Spiritual growth is a divine and human process, and we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. But what's phase two? Now, we might expect Paul to say, okay, if you're going to be a mature disciple, here's what you need to do. You need to serve the poor. You need to evangelize the lost. You need to resist temptation and put your sin to death. Those are all important things, but that's not the next thing that he says. So work out your own salvation with fear and trembling because God's working through you to will and to work for his good pleasure. So what's the next step? Verse 14. Do all things without grumbling and complaining. How about that? But the phase two is this, that our humble unity is a witness to the world. Our humble unity 
as a result of our spiritual maturity, is a witness to the world. Verse 14, do all things without grumbling or complaining. You could say grumbling would be like murmuring or, or bickering. Quarreling, or the disputing is, uh, again, that's some t- quantitation of just infighting and, and quarreling together. Verses 16, 15 and 16 say this, that you may be innocent, blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world holding fast to the word of life. In these verses, Paul actually makes a lot of subtle references to the Old Testament, in particular to the time of wilderness wanderings that we read about in the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy. Right? Again, think about Paul's first exhortation. He says, don't complain, don't grumble. Well, if you know anything about Israel's history, and particularly their history in the wilderness, you know that was a common occurrence Right, last fall, we were in the book of Exodus, and we noted that, you know, as soon as they're delivered through, from the, on the other side of the Red Sea, so what have they witnessed? They witnessed God perform mighty acts of judgment against the Egyptians. We witnessed them, God bring them out of the hand of slavery. He opened up the waters of the Red Sea so that they could pass through safely, and then he closed up the waters over Pharaoh and his army. And it only takes three verses in the Bible. Three verses past that episode for Israel to start complaining in Exodus chapter 16. And sorry, not three verses, three days. Three days. They, get, they emerge and in three days they're already complaining and infighting and this becomes a pattern for them. We, we want to be honest, they had some challenging circumstances. You know, hundreds of thousands of people in the wilderness without water. That's concerning. But it gets worse for Israel. In the book of Numbers, Israel walks up to the border of the promised land. The land that God had promised Abraham he would give to him and his descendants. And they're about to take it. But before they go in, they want to do some due diligence. So they send in some inspectors, some spies, to scout out the land to see what it is. And, you know, they say, listen, it really is as good as God said, but there are some nasty-looking people there, scary-looking people. And so the people get this report and they decide to veto Moses. I want us to read in Numbers 14 for just a moment how they, how they respond. It says, Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or that we had died in the wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones became, will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, let us choose a leader and go back. The people are on the cusp of the promised land, but they refuse to enter their inheritance. And the reason is because they lacked faith. They didn't trust that what God had promised, he would come through on and be faithful to deliver to them. Right? Faith means that we lay a hold to God's promises and what he has said. And, they, and so for the people of Israel, it would mean not complaining and entering into the land, right? They didn't form a back to Egypt committee and decide, let's go back. No, they were to go forward. And again, there is a place to complain, right? I want to be very careful about this as a leader, Right? While complaints against leadership can be dangerous, they are sometimes warranted. Again, I'm not going to say that as a leader I'm beyond scrutiny, that I'm beyond people who disagree with me. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what Paul is talking about here is the type of complaints which cause problems in churches. They're rarely reasoned and principled disagreements, but so often those type of disagreements are just bickering and sniping at one another. And so he has this exhortation do all things without grumbling or complaining, right? All it takes is for one group to start grumbling and to casting doubts upon the works of the leadership or upon the works of other people. And I just want us to all remember, it doesn't cost anybody a dime to cast aspersions upon someone else. But the price to be paid is paid by everybody, right? Leviticus 19 verses 16 says it this way, aware of this, how dangerous this could be, He says, you are not to go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor, indicating that the practice of slander is taking away the life from someone else. I am the Lord, God says. 
right, you have to think about if you're going to share a rumor that you've not confirmed, that's unrelated to others, who's going to pay the price for that rumor? Uh, there, there was a story one time of a, a rabbi in a, in a town, and there was a man who told nasty stories about him. And t- they're at the whole town. And after a little while, that guy felt sorry. He felt remorse for what he had done. And so he went to the rabbi and he said, I'm sorry for what I've done. Can I be forgiven? I want to make things right. And the rabbi told the man to go get a pillow, cut it open, and then to cast the feathers about everywhere. The man did that. And then the rabbi said, now go and collect the feathers. The man's heart sank, for the flowers had flown far and wide. So too, the rabbi declared, did his rumors and lies fly, and there's no getting them back. Or the famous Baptist preacher Charles Spurgeon said, a lie will go around the world twice before the truth has even put its shoes on. And so here's why we have to be careful, because our grumbling and our complaining has an effect upon our holiness and the ministry of God in the world. Remember, Paul says in verse 15, he says, Do all things without grumbling and complaining, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and a twisted generation. Right? If we are grumbling and complaining at one another, if that becomes our character, then what it means is that if, if we're to shine as lights in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation and the lights of the world, we're going to create a smog and a fog around those lights so that other people won't be able to see it. We know the hymn, send the light, send the gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. You are a light to the nations. Jesus says you are the light of the world. A city set upon a hill cannot be hidden. But sometimes we cover that light up. Well, we are to be holy. And we achieve this holiness, verse 16 says, by holding fast to the word of life. Again, that is the promise of the gospel. And so we have to make the gospel central to all we do. And we believe according to this promise. We love according to this promise. We hope according to God's promise. And so the first phase is that we work out our own salvation in fear and trembling. Phase two is realizing that that creates a united witness to the world, a humble unity that creates a united witness to the world. And phase three is this, that we strive for a life that matters. We strive for a life that matters. Earlier in the letter, Paul spoke to the Philippians about that they would have an occasion to boast in Christ if he showed up again and was able to minister to them for their progress and joy in the faith. But now Paul speaks about his own desire to boast in verse 16. He says, uh, Hold fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ, that is the day when Christ returns to judge the world and to save his people, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. That he doesn't want his work to be like a vapor, like we read about in the book of Ecclesiastes, that all life is vanity. There's an emptiness, of, a, 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 a brevity to it that just disappears before you can even hope to see it. No, he wants his life to have an impact that lingers far beyond his days. Imagine a man who decided he wanted to make an impact on the world, and he was a very generous man. He was a philanthropist, and so he worked very hard to raise money to build a hospital. He recruited people to help him out. He formed a board, and they made a decision about what they were going to do. And then he got a contractor to do the work and made it to be state-of-the-art. It was going to impact the health in that community for years. And the day before the hospital is to open and they cut the ribbon and start using it, lightning strikes and burns the hospital to the ground. Does that life, did that man's life have meaning? Right? We might want to say, well, yes, because he meant well, but what impact did his life make other than asking people to give of themselves? We don't want our lives to be that way. Paul actually used that metaphor in the book of 1 Corinthians. He said, listen, the, the, the person who lays the foundation is Jesus Christ himself, but the, all of our work will be tested one day, whether you've built with stone and precious metals and gold, or if you built with wood and hay and straw that's eventually just going to burn up, the day will come when our work is tested. But Paul wanted to make an impact, and indeed we have a desire to make an impact. Paul speaks of how he can live such a life in verse 17. He says, even if I'm to be poured out as a drink offering, a libation was what 
uh, McKenna read earlier in her translation, a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with you all. Again, Paul wants to make an impact. But he's not so choosy that he never commits, you see. Sometimes we're like, I want to make an impact on the world, but I'm just going to wait until the right opportunity comes. I'm going to vet every single chance. No, what he does is he gives his life for the sake of the gospel. Where he's at in prison, he understands that he may not survive. Right? He might pour out his life, literally. But he calls himself a drink offering. And I want us to understand what he means by that. Because in ancient Israel, they had a lot of different types of offerings. And a drink offering, you read about those in Numbers chapter 28. They were a type of offering that were offered every single day, along with there was a daily offering and a monthly offering that was given at the temple of an animal that was sacrificed. And alongside that, they would pour out some wine. And Paul is saying, listen, if you offer your life as a sacrifice, even if I'm poured out alongside, that's okay. I actually rejoice in that. It's actually a reminder, I think, as we think about Jesus' command to bear your cross and to take it up and to die to yourself every single day, that just like the daily drink offering, that's how we are to live. We remember what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Indeed, this is how we make an impact. And Paul's talking about a full orb of faith. It's trusting Jesus, it's following him with all that you have as our lives because we're a part of the body. It's realizing that together as a church, we have a public witness out into the world and that our conduct, our unity, our message that we proclaimed has implications not just on our lives but on the life of others. It's caring not only about the internal church health and unity but also about the external impact that we have as a congregation. And the fruit of all of this labor is joy. Paul says, even if I'm poured out as a drink offering, I rejo- I'm glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Right? It reminds me of something that the Apostle Paul said in the book of Hebrews, chapter, or not, no, Paul didn't write Hebrews. Somebody, we don't know who wrote Hebrews, but the book of Hebrews says, in chapter 11, he talks about the legacy of those who had faith, and that faith led them to follow God. So again, Abraham believed and he left his hometown. Moses believed and he forsook the wealth of Egypt in order that he might serve the people of God. Rahab, the prostitute, believed. And therefore she rescued God's people and gave them safe harbor in the land of Canaan. And this is what Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 3 says. It says, therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, a cloud, by the way, which has been added to by every saint who's gone before us in death, every person who's believed in Jesus, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Listen to this who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Jesus went to the cross, endured it for the joy that was set before him. I think there's something that we experience as human beings whenever we give our life on behalf of other people. Uh, we are often encouraged to be hedonists. That is, we want to live for, purely for the sake of pleasure. Right? And, and it's really easy because many of you, not everyone, has a smartphone where you can live your whole life with a, you know, you can spend hours and hours a day. The latest statistics show that people spend between four and six hours a day on their smartphone if they have one. It's easier than ever to be entertained Right? You grow up in an era where you, know, you have three channels on television and now you've got a million, uh, millions of YouTube channels you could watch at any hour of the day. We can make our life about ourselves. But if we give our lives in the service of Jesus Christ and the love and the service of other people, then that's a life that has an impact. And there's a joy that we can receive in that. Jesus tells us that if we are using what he has given us well, that we can receive joy. And I'm reminded of the parable of the tenants in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25. Remember that parable? There was a landowner who was going away, 
And so he gave, he had three servants, and he gave one servant five talents, that's a lot of money, another servant two talents, and another servant one. And when he returned, the one who had given, had given five had doubled the investment, he now had ten, the one who had given two had doubled it, now he had four, but the one who had one, he just sat on it. He was worried about the character of the master, he didn't indulge in that. I don't want to focus on that right now, I want to focus on the people who did use their gifts well. Jesus looks at those in, in, in Matthew 25, verse 21, and he says this, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with little, and I will make you faithful over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Enter into the joy of your master. You might say that those servants worked out their own salvation in fear and trembling. And this is something that we can do in our own lives. As we lay a hold of the promises of God by faith. And so today I want to ask you today, if, if you're here and you've never committed your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, maybe you're watching online, that the energy that Paul speaks about is only available to those who have placed their faith in Jesus, whom have received his Holy Spirit and whom God is actively outworking their salvation in their lives because God has transformed their heart. If you've never trusted Jesus before, if you've never placed your faith in him, then you can do so today. The author of Hebrews would say, today is the day of salvation. We have a righteousness that doesn't come from ourselves, but rather that through comes through faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God that depends upon faith. But the call is also for us who do believe in Jesus, who've believed in him for many, many years, that we would continue to work out our faith, that we wouldn't rest at that task. To remember that we do shine as lights on the world if we shine the light. Let's not cover up the light that Jesus has given us. Let's not put a basket over it. Let's not let Satan blow it out, as the song would say, but let's let our light shine as a joyful, loving people of God. As we read, as Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 says, as we bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Jesus Christ, that we would exhort one another, as Colossians 3 says, with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in our hearts toward God, as we build up one another in love. If you would, please bow your heads with me, and let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful, God, that you are a God who is continually at work within us, you have not abandoned us after your son Jesus Christ ascended to heaven. You didn't leave us by ourselves, but actually you sent us a helper. That's what Jesus promised. The Holy Spirit, the helper, the paraclete, the counselor who dwells within us, who unites us to one another, but more importantly, unites us to you. Father, I pray that as we consider our lives that we would not grow weary in doing good, that we would not grow tired about the quest for holiness and the passion for you, but rather that we would continue to live in our lives, that we would do all the things that your word commands, that we would continue to root out sin in our lives, that we would not allow anything to detract us from our affection toward you. Father, I pray that you would give us an eye and a heart for our neighbor and for those who are suffering and in need. Father, and I pray that as a congregation, because your word is addressed to a church and it's important for us here, that we would be a people not known for griping and grumbling and complaining, but rather that we would be a people who are known as the light, as those who bear witness to the light. Father, we don't want people to look at us and say, look how wonderful people they are. They're very nice. They've been there a long time. Father, we want to be a people who reflect the Son, who reflect your Son, Jesus Christ, to the world, so that when they look at us, they say, that is a people who reflect the love and mercy and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you would help us to renew our commitment to you. Would you renew our faith? Would you strengthen it? And would you help us to hope, Father, to have a focus on the joy that is offered in Jesus' name to us. Father, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus, your Son.